السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن وله ما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفرأيت من اتخذ إلهه هواه وأضله الله على علم وختم على سمعه وقلبه وجعل على بصره غشاوة فمن يهديه من بعد الله فلا تذكرون صدق الله العظيم وعن شداد بن أوس رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الكيس من دان نفسه وعمل لما بعد الموت والعاجز من أتبع نفسه هواها وتمنى على الله رواه الترمذي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا فتاح يا عليم we begin in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created us, sustains us, has blessed us with Islam, and has given us the ability to be gathered here in His remembrance. All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has made us from amongst the ummah of His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, his family, and all the Prophets before him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect those of us who choose to tread in their path. <coughs> the verse that I have recited is from Surah Jathiyah, Surah number 45, verse number 23, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and of course by extension us, is reminding us of the pitfalls of constantly following one's desires, making one's desires the primary objective or the priority of their life, that everything that a person does is in service of what they want as opposed to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. In order to understand this ayah, I want us to think about the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he reminds us of how a believer should ideally prioritize the actions of their lives. And of course we are not talking about the things that we do in order to live a good life, in order to live a virtuous life, in order to take care of our responsibilities. But rather, when it comes to the realm of responsibilities that we have to our Creator, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the believer ideally supposed to do? Or how is the believer ideally supposed to behave? 
Prophet ﷺ says that essentially there are two approaches. The first one is the intelligent approach. Al kayisu mandana nafsa wa amila lima ba'd al maut. A person who is intelligent, and by this, of course, the hadith is implying that a person is aware of Allah. They are aware of who they are in relation to Allah. They are aware of the primary objective of their life. And they are doing everything with their akhirah in mind. It is not necessarily about intelligence with regards to worldly affairs. But rather intelligence and in how a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lives their life according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al kayis a person who is intelligent will do things. Will do two things. Number one, they will subjugate themselves. They will subjugate their nafs. They will always take control and lead their nafs. They will not put themselves in control of their desires. They will not allow their desires to run amok free of control to the point where it becomes an addiction and they are in this constant cycle of destruction, of disobedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al kayisu mandana nafsahu. The believer is ideally supposed to be in control of that which is put in front of them as temptations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this realm of existence has given us essentially three places from which we are tempted or by which we are tempted. Number one, this world in addition to being a plane of existence in which we demonstrate our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do the things that will benefit us in the hereafter, this realm of existence has also been designed to tempt us in every way, shape or form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world and the things of this world in order for us to be distracted from our primary objective. Because when it comes to testing the veracity and the strength of something, if you want to really do quality control, you have to put it through rigorous testing. You have to make sure that it can withstand even the highest amount of pressure it is designed for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make the world of this, make, did not make the life of this world a cakewalk when it comes to following our desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very difficult, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us the capacity to withstand all of these temptations. So the world, this realm of existence is designed to distract us from our, from our primary objective in every way, shape or form. Number two, in addition to this plane of existence where a person might choose to perhaps live, live as a hermit. They might try to cut, them, cut themselves off from the world in every way, shape or form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us two continuous companions of temptation. The first is our own nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this innate desire within us that tempts us, that perhaps wants to lead us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our nafs is not something that we can shut out completely. What you can do is control it, but it is a constant companion. In addition to the nafs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given shaitan the ability to tempt us every single way. Shaitan has the ability to give us suggestions, to whisper. Shaitan has the ability to make things beautiful, to make things desirable, even though they are not desirable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the midst of these three sources, the believer who is intelligent, al-kayis, mandana nafsa, subjugates their desires to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not allow their desires to lead them, rather they are the ones in control of their desires. Why is this very important? That is explained in the ayah. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if a believer is able to do this, ideally they are intelligent, and they control themselves, what do they do? They prioritize the afterlife. Everything that they do in this world is going to be in service of their own hereafter. Everything that they do in this world is going to be in service of the hereafter. If anything is going to benefit them in the short term, which is the worldly life, but is going to harm them in the hereafter, the believer will not ideally go towards that course of action. If the believer does something, it will be something that will benefit them in the hereafter and perhaps in this world as well, or at the very least in the hereafter, because the believer is intelligent. On the other hand, if somebody does not have the right priority, does not have the right frame of mind, 
A person who is not intelligent, what do they do? Man atba'a nafsahu hawaha. They will make themselves subjugated or they will make themselves follow their desires. And their desires can be run amok. Their desires is going to lead them in every so direction, but absolutely it will lead them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on top of that, another pitfall of constantly following one's desires and not making a firm commitment and effort to stay away from sin and minimize sin is وَتَمَنَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ It gets to the point where a person will hopelessly have faith in Allah and hopelessly uh, hope for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala merciful? Absolutely. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compassionate? Absolutely. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His own statement, does He say that my mercy overpowers my anger? Absolutely. But that does not give a person, us, it does not give His creation license to sin. We can't do what we want, hoping for the best in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants efforts from our side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to demonstrate some form of commitment and any slight mishaps and mistakes that we had committed, we can hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive that. Now keeping this hadith in mind, why is it necessary for each and every single one of us as we try to become better Muslims in terms of amal, in terms of practice, in terms of knowledge, in terms of character. Why is it equally important, if not more important for us to minimize our sins? Whenever we think about ourselves as believers, it is not just about being the best Muslim in terms of good deeds. It is also minimizing the amount of bad deeds that we do. It is also about minimizing the sins that we commit. It is about minimizing the consistency in which we sin. It is absolutely critical for a person to make sure that what they, what they do on a daily basis is focusing equally on worshipping Allah, obeying Allah, but also equally on not disobeying Allah. Right? Many a times we think that our good deeds will wipe out our bad deeds or it will even them out, it will balance them out. So we might think along the lines of, what's the problem if I watch these things? Or what's the problem if I use my eyes in this way? What's the problem if I listen to these things? What's the problem if I say these things? What's the problem if I do this, this, that? I pray five times a day. I still know Allah and His Messenger. Because you cannot have those two things coexist and expect your good deeds to benefit you in the long term. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in this particular verse of Surah Jathiya, Surah number 45, verse number 23, the Prophet is being addressed. That, O Prophet, do you see the person who has taken their desires as their God? Right? A person who has taken their desires as their God. What does it mean by this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have phrased. This particular ayah in another way, in many other ways. Allah could have just said, can you see the person? Do you see the person who follows their desires? But Allah said, they had made their desires their God. And what do we consider within the definition of God? Somebody who is worthy of absolute obedience. So a person without filter, without any resistance whatsoever, whatever they wish to do, they do. The only one, the only being who is worthy of absolute fealty, absolute obedience is Allah. Absolute commitment is Allah. Even our parents who have been afforded the highest stations of respect and honor in this world, and as a consequence in the hereafter as well, you are permitted to disobey them if it means to disobey the Creator. If the command of your parents, if the suggestions of your parents mean that a person is going to disobey Allah, then you are permitted in those instances to disobey your parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is worthy of absolute obedience. If a person unwittingly, without resistance, follows their desires, their desires become their object of worship. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah mentions that when it comes to worshipping idols, we don't only have to think of idols as made out of wood and stone and physical objects. A person can be in worship of their ego, they can be in worship of their wealth, they can be in worship of their knowledge. They love the fact that they know and they love the fact that they can show that knowledge. You are in worship of something else other than Allah. That is the meaning of taking your desires as your God. Anything that you wish to do, 
you do. أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهُهُ هَوَى Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing our attention to this type of individual. Why? Allah wants us to remember and realize the pitfalls of consistently following our desires. What happens if a person realizes too late or is never given the chance to realize that they have been drifting from Allah for so long? Is there any way back? At some point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will not give you the means to come back to him. And that is absolutely dangerous because it can happen without us realizing, without us actively monitoring ourselves, disciplining ourselves. A person who has made their objectives, who has made their desires, their God, literally their entire identity is perhaps based on how they feel, is based on what they want to do. What happens? That's the first step towards destruction. Allah lets them knowingly go astray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of everything. Just because a person is drifting away from Allah doesn't mean Allah billah, is unaware of that. Allah knows that this person is moving away from Allah. But at that particular time, you still have some agency. You still have the capacity to think that I'm doing something wrong. When a person sins for the first time, and this is a new sin. In other words, you've never done it before. There is an inherent sense of guilt and shame that follows that. A person is very, very aware of the fact that they have done something wrong. But what happens when it becomes a habit? What happens when it becomes an addiction? Allah is not even on the list of things that you might think about. It might not even cross your mind. But in the very beginning, even though you are disobeying Allah, that fitrah is still speaking to you. you still remind, you're still reminded of the fact that you have done something wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created mechanisms, either environmentally or within ourselves, environmentally through amar bil ma'roof, nahi anil munkar, good company, things like that. And within us through our fitrah of mechanisms that remind us if we are going off track. It's like your lane assist in your cars. If you're drifting, it blinks or it beeps or whatever it is, it reminds you that, okay, you should get back on track. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts letting a person go astray. وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts letting a person move away from him. The further you are away from the mercy of Allah, the more susceptible you are to the temptation, temptations of shaitan. Eventually, you create the circumstances of your own destruction. So what's the next step? Allah has let you move away from His mercy. What's the next step? وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِ وَقَلْبِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals their ears. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals their hearts. وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ غِشَاوَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a veil over their eyes. What does it mean? means that when a person hears good advice, sincere advice, when a person hears somebody being concerned for them, when a person hears the direct words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the direct words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it does not register. It does not register as something important, as something that is worth listening to and following. وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِ Because ultimately what divided or what created the Sahaba and everyone else. Because both groups, both believers and non-believers at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu directly heard revelation from the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu What divided them? One listened and one just heard. وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala seals off the hearts, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala seals off the ears. You can listen to all of the lectures, you can try to give nasiha to somebody to the best of your ability. But if a person is not enabled to, to really, really take in what Allah has meant for them to do, it doesn't affect them. Allah seals off the hearts, which means you are not even tempted to think about what is right. You don't think about your akhirah. You don't think about the long-term consequences of following your desires, of consistently sinning and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shut off two avenues through which you can actually be reminded of Allah. And then, وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ غِشَاوَةِ 
There's a metaphorical veil over your eyes. Does it mean you become blind? No. It becomes you see the things that are right and you don't recognize it as right. You see things that are considered to be moral by the standards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and you consider that to be immoral. Or you see what's immorality according to the standards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you consider that to be okay. You don't have the capacity to think anymore. You don't have the capacity to think, you don't have the capacity to see, and you don't have the capacity to listen. And that's an indictment. That's a state of existence from which there is no return. Because Allah says after that, Who will guide that person after Allah? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is of course no one. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to get to a point by your own circumstances, by your own choices, you have created the cycle of disobedience and destruction for yourself and you have not reached out to Allah, who can guide you other than Allah? فَمَنْ يَهْدِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهِ Who can guide you other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No one. So whenever it comes to doing amal, whenever it comes to practicing, whenever it comes to thinking about our religion, it should never just be in terms of, I want to maximize all of the good deeds that I want to do. Right? I want to maximize all of the good deeds that I want to do. I want to add this to my daily regimen. I want to do this adhkar. I want to recite this much Quran. I want to do this for my salah, etc., etc. But equally important, if not more so, is the fact that we have to cut off the means by which we can be moving away from Allah. Because we might not realize, we might not realize the effect even a small sin has on ourself. If done consistently, every single sin will absolutely lead to another sin. That is how shaitan tempts. Shaitan does not present the most gravest of sins as the first option. It starts from the smallest of things. You work your way up because you become more and more desensitized. You become more and more susceptible to the temptation of your nafs, of shaitan, because you are further and further removed from the mercy of Allah. So for us to think that, oh, you know, I'm not doing this, at least it's not murder, at least it's not zina, you know, example. At least I'm not doing this, at least I'm not doing that. Well, you only need one small thing. Because even a drop of water over time can cut through rock. Even just a small amount of water, consistency over time can lead to devastating effects. So you might think, and we might think to ourselves, it's just one small sin. Look at all the good that I do. It outweighs it. That's not the point. It's not a numbers game. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that you've done this many million acts of good deeds and this, you know, a couple of hundred thousand sin and you've won. That's not the point. That's not how we are supposed to be measuring our deen. It's not a numbers game. You can just be doing the bare minimum. You can just be doing the bare minimum, but if you stay away from sin or you minimize, minimize to the best of your capacity, what you are capable of doing, what you are tempted to do on a daily basis, it will absolutely have that much more of a benefit for you, for your deen, compared to the person who is perhaps doing so much more than you, but at the same time has no control over their desires, has no control over the amount of sin that they do. Both have to be maintained. We have to maximize our good, minimize our wrong. Maximize our good, minimize our wrong. Consistently on a daily basis. And this is perhaps something that we should keep in mind as the quote-unquote new Islamic year is coming up. That's not when we only think about uh, taking an account of ourselves or taking an account of what we do and what we don't do. But every single moment is where a person has to think to themselves, am I trying to do as much good and am I causing myself that much harm as well? We have to constantly remind ourselves it's not just about worshipping Allah and obeying Allah, it's also about not disobeying Allah. It's also about staying away from sin. Amar bil ma'aruf nahi anil munkar That's why it is a pair, it goes hand in hand. It is not just about talking it is not just about talking about virtues. It is not just about telling people to do good. It is also equally important to remind ourselves and the people around us of staying away from sin. Because it has an adverse 
permanent effect. For the believer, permanency, when it comes to thinking about our existence, is not just this world. We don't want anything to impact our akhirah. And this is one way, and perhaps the most insidious way, because you don't realize it. Right? A person does not typically realize that they have an addiction until it's too late. And every single one of us can attest to this, that committing any act of sin can become an addiction. And even if you don't think of it in those terms, the mere fact that any small thing is simply a disobedience to Allah, we don't want that to adversely affect the entirety of our good deeds that we do on a daily basis. So, as much as we want to maximize our good, every single one of us can at least think to ourselves, what sin do I struggle with? Every single one of us has a sin that we struggle with. And many, many more perhaps. But what can I focus on on a daily basis to make sure that I am actively targeting something that is destroying my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us. May give us knowledge that benefits us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to make Him the object of our obedience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to completely commit and obey and give our fealty to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to minimize our sins, to stay away from the things that will destroy our hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide, bless and protect us all. Wallahu a'lam wa billahi tawfiq wa qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimina fastaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصيهما فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار رب ارحمهما كما رب يعني صغيرة ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم اكفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وأغننا بفضلك عمن سواك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الهم والحزن والعجز والكسل والجبن والبخل وضلع الدين وغلبة الرجال اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعلنا منهم واخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا منهم عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون أقم الصلاة